Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 253, which reads as follows. Paravajan upasisa nichang ujjhana sanyino asavatasa vadhanti Araso asavakaya Which means For one who is focused on the transgressions of others Always perceiving fault For such a one, the asava increase. They are very far from the destruction of the asava. So this, I think, is our first verse that there really isn't a story behind. There is rather simply a, a person, a monk. The monk who came to be known as Ujjhana Sanyi, one who perceives fault. And, well, I guess the story is that he went around perceiving fault in all the monks. They didn't wear their robes right, they didn't perform their duties right, they didn't act right, they didn't speak right. Dwelling always on the faults of others. The monks brought it to the attention of the Buddha And the Buddha taught this verse That's it So the simple lesson It's in pattern with the uh, verse 252 And with this chapter Of finding fault The lesson is that finding fault is not a good thing But there's much more to it than that, of course. We have to answer the question as to what's wrong with finding fault in others. And in fact, we have to qualify it. Because it's not true that finding fault in others is always wrong. And that's not exactly what the Buddha says in this verse. We want to find out what's bad Why is it bad to find fault, for example We have to be able to, as usual, distinguish Between conventional reality and ultimate reality When we say something is bad or good in conventional reality There's meaning behind that, certainly Taking this example in particular, finding fault in other monks can be a very good thing. It's good for communal harmony to point out each other's faults. At the end of the rains, our three-month rains, when the rain has stopped and the monks are ready to head off, before they head off, there's, a, there's an occasion for informing each other of anything you might have done, you might have done wrong during your three-month retreat. You invite, the monks invite each other to point out their faults, their transgressions. But of course, in practice, because of the... the Categorical difference between ultimate reality and conventional reality In practice, pointing out the faults of others often doesn't go very well If it's not done well And, and uh, as this verse points out Done well or not, if it's not done with the right intentions 
if it's um, if it's done purposefully in the sense of making it one's practice and and by extension not just making it one's practice to find faults in others but in general making it one's practice to exist in the external so the obvious problem with on an ultimate level with finding fault in others is the the, the corruption, the impurities of mind that generally and quite often take control of the mind when one enters into this fault-finding mind. The asava, as the Buddha said. Things like greed, you can be manipulative, wanting to manipulate people for your own benefit, finding fault in them. Anger, you can want to hurt others, finding fault in them to make them feel suffering. And delusion can be simply out of conceit or ignorance. Lack of consideration. So, I mean, not quite often, of course, conceit. Maybe low self-esteem, of course, high self-esteem. You think you're better than someone, worse than them, and so it's a big reason for reason for going external, wanting to show your goodness, your own worth, for example. But there's an important point about being fixated on the external as opposed to the internal. If you're fixated on your own faults, that's of course a problem, but it lacks the problem or the the danger of focusing on the faults of others because we can say that finding faults in others is helpful. If you find fault in others, well, that's a good thing for them. It'll also make you feel happy that you've you've done them a service perhaps. But who's to say it actually benefits them? Who's to say they take it in the right way? And even if they take it in the right way, whether they're actually able to practice in such a way to better themselves, to change their behavior. It can be very important to let people know, but it's not the most important thing. The, the, extern the practice of seeking good in the external is fraught with danger, with problem. You can't be sure what the result is going to be. And the result, direct result, is not actually the greatest benefit. At best, it can be a catalyst for others to implement the change person on a personal level. Moreover, it's, it's by its very nature a, a difficult, challenging, experience to keep pure if you consider the difference when you look at your own faults you're looking at experience suppose you get angry and you know that anger is a fault and you maybe you feel bad about that well that's not a good thing it's not good to be angry at your anger for example but at the very least you it's a very prime primary experience it's based on experiences when you focus on someone else's problems you don't actually experience anger if they're angry let's say you want to tell someone about their anger first you have to process the experience you have to think about the person you have to think about what you're going to say how you're going to say it your mind is in a complex state because of the conceptual nature you have to conceive of the other person and this is why it's it's prime breeding ground for unwholesomeness because we get lost in the concepts we're no longer tr truly focused on our state of mind we're too much focused on the other person and so any bad habits we might have that we haven't worked out ourselves are easily able to overcome us and, and this is why our uh, work in on the external level is quite often uh, unsuccessful, tainted by our own, our own defilement. 
and also why the Buddha reminded us or encouraged us to focus on our own faults. If everyone focuses on their own faults, of course there are far fewer faults to find in each other. But more importantly, it's the work that can actually be done. You can easily find the faults, your own faults, much more easier, much more easier than, than you can work out the faults of others. And this relates to this word asava. I didn't translate it purposefully because it's not such a hard word to understand. It's just it's hard, a bit hard to understand uh, the Buddha's use of it without explanation. It's one of those words that, uh, because it hasn't become a, a word used in this way in English, we don't really have a good catch word. All the translations I've seen I don't think are very accurate at all. They're not very literal. It refers to defilements, but it's not it's not a word that means defilements. Corruptions, impurities of the mind, things that cause suffering, problems for us, mental problems. It's a way of describing mental problems and in fact a way a word that the Buddha used quite often, far more often than we actually um uh, we actually teach this word. So it's not a word that means defilement. It's a way of describing defilements as being outflowings. Asava means literally something that pours out or leaks or, or oozes. Right? If you think of a, a leaky pot or a, a, um, an infected wound, if it's if if it's infected, you know it will never stop oozing. It will never stop leaking. But I think the real uh, meaning of this word, and why the Buddha used it, is related to this idea of <clears throat> not just externalizing, but going outside, going beyond, leaking, going beyond the pure, simple real like like reality based state of mind where you experience things as they are this phrase experience thing, things as they are is a very powerful and important statement it's a bold claim that that's what we do in buddhism we try to experience things as it's not a very hard thing to understand but it's very important buddhism is not about and meditation is not about sequestering yourself away from reality by any means it's about trying to experience reality deeper more fundamental than the external conceptual world right we we try to focus on the real world of relationships and think that people who meditate are leaving behind that but in fact it's quite the opposite as we externalize ourselves, we ignore so much of what's real about ourselves. We ignore and we, we lose track of our emotions and, and therefore are unable to navigate our relationships purely because our minds are caught up in whatever whim uh, is our habit of the moment. So this state of experiencing things as they really are is like the pot. And when we go outside of that, when we interpret, when we extrapolate, when we see something that isn't there or react in a way that is unwarranted, that's an asava. That's the meaning of asava, going beyond. When we're not uh, strong enough or pure enough to see things as they are, we see them as bad or good or me or mine. We go beyond. We leak. That's the usage of the word asava. And the Buddha used it quite often. Much more often than, than we actually hear this word asava in, in, in talks. I think, I think also because it's mistranslated. Not maliciously so, but in a way that hides the meaning here. It's a very technical, I think technical term. Because the word, of course, defilement or impurity, it's emotionally charged. 
but on a technical level, it seems that the Buddha preferred, uh, when speaking technically, to talk about it simply as leaking, as uh, overflowing, not not being in a good state, uh, a healthy or a, a, a composed state. It's a way of describing what defilements do. They lead us outward. They lead us to cling to things, to run away from things. They lead us away from our equilibrium. There are four types of asava, and I'll just talk about these because it gives us an idea of how the Buddha used this word and the Buddha's teachings on what's wrong, what goes wrong, when we find fault with others. Again, this idea of, of focusing on the faults of others and obsessing and always interested in the faults of others, it, it's really that which is the leak. It's not the, find, the, the telling people about their faults or even seeing the faults of others. It's where the mind becomes obsessed, where, where your intention, your inclination is rather than seeing things, seeing reality, being with reality, is in a very conceptual and, and complex state of finding the faults in beings other than yourself and, and pointing them out to others and talking about them, maybe gossiping about them, telling other people about them behind their back and so on and so on. It's very complicated. The state of mind behind all of those actions is complex and highly problematic and, and so the four types the four you could say the four reasons why one might leak in this way are for for sensuality kama so because you want something from someone so you manipulate them if I point out what they're doing wrong they'll uh, They'll rely upon me, maybe they'll, they, if, if we're uh, vying for a position in employment, for example, maybe I tell other people about their faults or I make them feel like they don't deserve it and then it will allow me to get what I want. Maybe more money or so on, you can manipulate people by belittling them. Bhavasava is, I guess, more related to fault finding Bhavasava is uh, relating to uh, states or existence so the, the meaning here is wanting something to be a certain way or not be a certain way and it relates to manipulation you, you manipulate people or you point out people's faults because you don't want them to be a certain way or you want them to be a certain way we want our children to be a certain way so we point out what they're doing wrong right? wrong is such an interesting concept as well it relates to the third which is ditasova our idea of what is wrong so the reason why we leak and in this case why we find why we obsess about the faults of others relates to our idea things must be this way and our very wrong view of that things must be a certain way in the first place finding fault is very much tied up with thinking things must be a certain way you find this in Buddhist monasteries often when monks have done their due diligence and learned about the way monasteries should be then they get quite frustrated and upset when they find out that monasteries aren't that way Organizations like our, our meditation organization, we often deal with this people frustration that things aren't a certain way or should be a certain way. It's really a wrong, it's related to wrong view. You know, in reality, things not should be a certain way or shouldn't be a certain way, they are a certain way. And the real problem in, in the world is that we can't understand things as being the way they are we can't see things as being that way we see them as being the wrong way and uh, some other way as being the right way and so we're constantly trying to fix and make things better and so on 
And it's that fixing mindset state that makes us leak. We, we go out, we ooze all sorts of frustrations, angers and desires and ambitions and so on. And finally, avijja, so uh, one big reason, perhaps the biggest and overarching reason why we leak is just ignorance. Not realizing the suffering that comes from getting caught up in anything, clinging to anything, wanting for anything. And so the lesson for our practice is the reminder of this composed state and the danger of leaking, the danger of letting our minds go beyond what is real. Anytime we get caught up in interactions with the external world at all, even things, simple things like eating, working, cleaning, we run the risk because of the complexity, we run the risk of leaving behind reality and getting caught up in, in manipulation, reaction, and so on. And so if we're going to engage with other people at all or other things at all, we have to be very careful, like carrying a fragile pot or vase or, or valuable possession, fragile possession, to carry it with care and not let it break. As the Buddha likened, and this is a, probably a relation to the Asava, the concept of the Asava is, Buddha likened it to a, a man who was carrying a big pot of oil. And he, see, he said, imagine there was a man who was told he had to carry a big pot of oil full to the brim. And he had to carry it throughout the entire city. And they had they ordered a man with a sword to walk behind him. And if he let any one drop of oil spill, that man was to cut off this, this other man's head. And the Buddha said, now that man, do you think he would be distracted by any uh, singing or dancing or, or amusement uh, happening as he walked through the city or anyone calling out to him or any beautiful woman or man or... Uh, Anything that might distract him, good food to eat. And no venerable sir, yes. He said, well you should think like this. You should be as careful as that man. We really have to. Our pot is very fragile. Easily broken. Of course easily put back together. It's not the end of the world when you get distracted, obviously. It's just your concentration that's broken and you can regain it and build it and fortify it through the practice of mindfulness. It reminds us about the importance of our practice in worldly things as well when relating to others, to not get into the fault-finding mind for all these reasons, because of greed, because of fear, because of uh, feeling feeling in, uh, inferior or su superior because of views or desires, because of ignorance. To not be ignorant, to have a sense of what's right and what's important. And when you do engage with others, whether it be finding fault or praise, you do so mindfully with a sense of it being appropriate without any clinging, without any attachment, and letting it go and continuing on once it's done. So an important lesson, a good opportunity to talk about the asava, which are a very important teaching. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening.